the key with Daniel, and when we are unlocking these time periods, we're not going to be talking about the 70 weeks, although it does have to do with Jerusalem, but the key to Daniel is Jerusalem. Uh, Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 mentions Jerusalem. The third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now right through the prophecy, Jerusalem keeps on being talked about. And we'll remember that Daniel prayed to, opened his windows and prayed to Jerusalem. And the 70 week prophecy says from the time of the uh, decree to rebuild Jerusalem, 70 weeks will happen, of course relating to the sacrifice of the Lord. But all the other prophecies talk about Jerusalem, the holy city, the sanctuary. And in the last verse, the first verse Jerusalem was mentioned, in the last verse Daniel is told, you will stand in your lot at the end of the days. Now, Daniel was a prince. The lot means the inheritance. He was a prince of Judah. It's going to be right near Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is covered right the way through the prophecy. And the time periods all relate to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the holy city, the sanctuary, and the abomination of desolation is established in Jerusalem. So the time periods we're looking at all, remember, have to do with the holy city, with the temple, with Jerusalem in some form or other. So these are the time periods we're talking about and we're going to be talking about placing ourselves in the time of the end because that's where we are. Uh, we saw in Daniel chapter 12 uh, and from 11 verse 40 lots of talk about the time, the time, the times, the time of the end, the end, the end, finished, accomplished. It's all the end times. And we are living in the end times. Now, in support of all that I'm saying, the exposition of Daniel by Brother Thomas, 1868. Brother Thomas gave us all the clues, all the foundation principles, all the things to look for, they're all there. Now, Brother Thomas thought that the time of the end, the latest date he put was 1908. Now, he wrote that in 1868. He was only nine years out. 1917 began the time of the end. That's what we're going to be talking about. And we're still in the time of the end. And we're going to ask the question, why is it taking so long, this time of the end? Well, first of all, have a look at Daniel chapter 12 because that's what we'll be concentrating on largely. Uh, notice verse 4, seal the book even to the time of the end. But the, in the time of the end, the book is unsealed. It's opened up. Now, Brother Thomas didn't live in the time of the end. You know, he died in 1871. Time of the end didn't start till 1917. But he did tell us all about the time of the end in this book. And I'll refer to a few parts of it as we go through. Uh, Daniel says, I heard, but I understood not. And I asked, what shall be the end of these things? Go thy way, Daniel. The book's closed till the time of the end, which means now it's open. It's open for us to understand. Why is the time of the end taking so long? Well, I am going to answer that, but a bit later on in the talk. Why is it taking so long for all these things to happen? Brothers and sisters and young people, we are at a crucial time in history. The Lord said to his disciples at another crucial time in history, he turned to his disciples and he said, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and haven't seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and haven't heard them. We are the blessed. The prophets, Daniel himself in particular here, wanted to know, what about the time of the end? We know. It's here. It's revealed to us. It has been unsealed. And we're going to sing a beautiful hymn at the conclusion, O blessed are the eyes which see the living way. We are blessed to live in these times. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely amazing, these days in which we're living. We're also going to ask the question about one of the important dates that perhaps we have overlooked, 1978, the Camp David Accords. We're going to come to that, but here's the detail of the Camp David Accords, just briefly. In 1978, the leaders of Egypt and Israel met with President Jimmy Carter at the presidential retreat at Camp David, Maryland. The meeting gave birth to the Camp David Accords, 
a framework for peace in the Middle East. In 1978, a little over a year after taking office, President Jimmy Carter invited Sadat and Israel's Prime Minister Menachem Begin to his retreat at Camp David, Maryland. Serving as an intermediary, Carter worked with each leader separately to draft two dual accord documents in a secretive 12-day process. The document stipulated that Israel give the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt. In exchange, Egypt would give Israel permission to use the Suez Canal for trade. The significance of these agreements did not go unnoticed. Sadat and Begin received the 1978 Nobel Peace Prize. Egypt and Israel officially began a diplomatic relationship and reinstated trade between them. And they've been at peace for a long time, ever since. There has not been a war since 1978 involving Egypt with Israel. The world noticed that and gave those two men the Nobel Peace Prize. But we didn't notice. Not really. We didn't know the significance. And I'm going to let you know what the significance is, again, a little later in the talk. 1978 was a crucial year in regard to Jerusalem. So we'll talk about that. Okay, so we're going to talk particularly about the 1260 days, the 1290 days and the 1335 days, all there we read in Daniel chapter 12. Three time periods that are all relevant to the final days. So we'll talk about those, but we need to put them in their context. Now, Brother Thomas, in uh, Exposition of Daniel, I won't actually open the pages, but I've got the mark there, page 74, under the heading, The Time of the End. He says, the time of the end, then, is the period of the opening and unsealing of the words of the book. In other words, we get to know what these prophecies really mean in detail in the time of the end, in this period, uh, so that it may speak intelligibly to the wise, and we want to be among the wise. The opening and unsealing is affected by the events of the time being an unmistakable fulfilment of what is written, so that every one of the wise cannot fail to understand. So we do understand these things because we believe we are among the wise who understand these things at the time of the end. Now we read from verse 40 of uh, chapter 11, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Now that happened about 106 years ago. The next part of the verse hasn't happened yet. All right? So that happened way back in 1917. The king of the north hasn't come down yet. But the little horn, which we'll talk about, that is the power of the north that was centred in Constantinople, in Turkey today, the king of the south pushed him out of Jerusalem. Again, it's all about Jerusalem. Now, Brother Thomas goes on to say in that section, <clears throat> the time of the end has its beginning and ending, and period intermediate between the beginning and the ending. And there, there are prophecies being fulfilled in that time frame between the beginning of the time of the end and the end of the time of the end. Its approach is marked, this is Brother Thomas writing 50 years before the event, its approach is marked by an event connected with Egypt. So the King of the South is centred in Egypt and it's ended by a consummation connected with Israel. When he comes to his end, none shall help him on the mountains of Israel. At the time of the end shall the King of the South push at him. Brother Thomas knew this, he said, this is for the power in Egypt to attack, and the attack is upon the Ottoman regime. He said that in 1868 didn't happen until 1917. Amazing foresight and understanding of Scripture. Brother Thomas was the master of the exposition of the Scripture. A master of exposition. He went into great detail. He checked all the Hebrew, he checked all the contexts, and he put it all together. So he said the Ottoman regime will be pushed out by the ruler of Egypt. I put a double bracket there. He didn't know that was Britain and the Allies. He didn't really know who it was who was going to be in Egypt in 50 years' time. You can understand that. And that indicates the approach of the time of the end. That's the beginning, he says, of the time of the end. So in 1917, there's General Allenby marching into Jerusalem, and that begins this period called the time of the end, the period of the opening and unsealing of the words of the book. So Christadelphians, brethren and sisters, we all know how the book has been opened and unsealed because it's all related to Jerusalem 
and the time of the end, all these prophecies. Now, to get the context, we need to think about Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4 tells us about the period that would lead up to the time of the end. Remember Daniel chapter 4 was Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the great tree. And he, he is the great tree. All the birds are lodged in the branches, the animals gather underneath, it fills the whole earth. It's his kingdom. And the tree is cut down. And he's told, seven times will pass over you until the end of the days. Daniel 4, verse 34. After he's spent his seven years, seven times with the beasts, we read in verse 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes to heaven and blessed God. And we read from no more about Nebuchadnezzar other than that he is blessing God at the end of his life. The words at the end of the days in verse 34 are the same as the last verse of Daniel where Daniel will stand in his lot at the end of the days. So this prophecy is about the end time, the time of the end, the end of the days and seven times. Seven times is 2,520 years. Did you know that? Did you know that? A time in the Bible is a year. A time in the Jewish year is 360 days, 12 months of 30 days. That's the Jewish lunar year. So that's a standard Jewish year. So seven times is 2,520 years. The prophecy is telling us that the kingdom of men, who Nebuchadnezzar represented as the king of Babylon and the kingdom of men, and remember the prophecy said, this proves that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. The kingdom of men dominates the world, God determines the rulers, and at the same time, the Jewish people are downtrodden, downtrodden, and the sanctuary becomes a desolation. Now that word in the prophecy of Daniel happens a lot, the abomination of desolation. Desolation of Jerusalem, desolation of the holy place, desolation of the sanctuary, the temple destroyed, and so on. So that's what uh, this prophecy is about. Brother Thomas says this, he says, you know, on page 110, this prophecy is about the times of the kingdom of Babylon, the Babylonish kingdom of men, and the times of Judah's desolation. So to read what he says, he says, the seven times during which Nebuchadnezzar herded with the beasts, that's when he was out and acted like an animal in the field for seven years, were the sign period. He says a day for a year, we know that rule, uh, is uh, the time, pre prophetic times are all reduced down to days, years to days. In seven times, seven times 360, we have 2,520 days, which are prophetically equal to the same number of solar years. So instead of it being, when we turn it to years, a 360 day year, it's our normal cycle of a year. So it's 2,520 normal cycles of a year, solar years. The end of these is the terminus of the times of the Babylonish kingdom of men. And he also says, Judah is also going through a seven times period at the same time. Judah have also seven times allotted to them before they can obtain deliverance from Babylonish oppression and reproach. Well, that's in Leviticus chapter 26, which we'll look at in just a second. So at this time, in Daniel's prophecy, remember he's there, the temple has been destroyed during that period that Daniel's in Babylon. The kingdom of Israel comes to its end. The kingdom of men begins with Nebuchadnezzar. You can see on the left there, uh, the Babylonians smashing the, uh, uh, the brazen pillars of the temple and the brazen sea. You can see the people being carted off into captivity. You can see the temple being destroyed. That's a turning point. And that period is the beginning of this time when the kingdom of men is enlarged and the people of Judah are persecuted. If you go back to Leviticus 26, there's a, a parallel, um, and we will just look at that. Leviticus 26, you can see it on the screen there, though. Uh, uh, God forecasts that Judah would be punished seven times. And Brother Thomas picks this up and equates it with the seven times that passed over Babylon. 
Verse 17, they that hate you shall reign over you, ye shall flee when none pursueth you, and ye will not, uh, if you will not for all this hearken unto me, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Who might have thought, well, there's not much meaning to that. Yes, there is. Brother Thomas points it out. It's the same seven times as that Nebuchadnezzar uh, was uh, given to understand. Uh, and four times in this chapter, I'll bring seven times more plagues on you. I'll punish you yet seven times for your sins, seven times. In Leviticus 26, the seven times is mentioned four times in the chapter. In Daniel chapter 4, the seven times is mentioned four times in the chapter. It's the same period of time. And notice this, verse 19, God says to the Israelitish people, I will break the pride of your power, exactly as happened to Nebuchadnezzar, because of his pride it was broken. And I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. Iron and brass. Iron and brass, that's the image, isn't it? That's also the bands that were put around the base of the tree, iron and brass, which represents, of course, uh, brass and iron, uh, the Greek uh, dominion and the Roman dominion, which lasted right through until the end of the times of the kingdom of men and the desolation. And in verse 31 of that chapter, I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries into desolation. That's the same terms as Daniel was talking about the sanctuary brought into desolation, the abomination that maketh desolate. And so Israel is punished for seven times. And the kingdom of men lasts for seven times to punish Israel during that period. And that's 2,520 years. Seven times. So I'll pass over there. Uh, in the four times it's mentioned there in Daniel chapter 4, back in Daniel, seven times, 360 days, 2,520 years. Now, 12 months after Nebuchadnezzar was uh, given the interpretation of that dream, he's standing there and looking out of Babylon, he says, isn't this great Babylon that I built for the house uh, of, my, of the kingdom by the might of my power and the honour of my majesty? Pride and power, same as we saw in Leviticus 26. And of course, then the great tree is cut down and he's driven out and there's merely a stump of iron and brass, same as was mentioned in the Leviticus 26 about uh, Israel being persecuted, and they're persecuted largely by the iron and brass kingdoms. That is, of course, the Greeks and the Romans, the iron. And the silver is not mentioned because the Medo-Persians didn't really have a lot to do with, uh, uh, with uh, I suppose, destruction of uh, Jerusalem or, or persecution of the Jews, apart from Haman the Agagite, but really the, the Medes and the Persians were uh, not really oppressors of the Jewish people. But the iron and the brass certainly were, weren't they, down through history. So Nebuchadnezzar is punished for seven years for destroying the temple, the city and the people of God as a symbol of the overall rule of the kingdom of men for seven times. Till thou know the most high rules in the kingdom of men, which he did for seven years or 2,520 year days. So Daniel 2, this uh, vision of Nebuchadnezzar's image, of course, is all about the latter days too and the overthrow of the kingdom of men by the stone being cut out of the mountain with our hands. That's, of course, yet to be totally fulfilled. Daniel chapter 3, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, saw himself as the whole image of gold. If there's going to be an image of the kingdom of men, uh, I'm going to set it up and it's going to be all gold, not just a head of gold. Well, that represented the fact that the whole of the kingdom of men from Nebuchadnezzar's day right down to 1917 was actually a Babylonish kingdom of men. You might say it's still continuing, which is to some degree, because we are in this time of the end. All the kingdoms of history were Babylonish in character because of their false doctrine, false teaching, false practices, and, and very much uh, uh, the whole principle of Babylonish thought continues even today. Now Daniel's three friends, this is interesting, of course uh, when they went into the furnace it was heated seven times hotter. Seven times again, we read. And of course this is, was a symbol of the seven times of persecution which would come upon Israel. And though the fire would be there and they would suffer all that persecution, they wouldn't be destroyed, as Daniel's three friends were not. 
So in Daniel, the multi-metal image of Daniel chapter 2, right, with a head of gold, silver, brass and iron, uh, the golden image of Daniel chapter 3, the great tree of Daniel chapter 4, they all represent the Babylonish kingdom of men. When did the kingdom of men start? A lot of us have thought that the cutting down of the tree was the beginning of the seven times. No. The, the, the image, or the dream rather, represented all the period of the kingdom of men. When did it start? When Nebuchadnezzar became so prominent as the first king in the kingdom of men that Daniel pointed to him and said, Thou art this head of gold. That's when the kingdom of men started, as far as the scripture is concerned. And that was in the second year of the uh, reign of Nebuchadnezzar, we're told in Daniel chapter 2, which is 603 BC. How good your maths? Brother Thomas said in page 112 of this book, Exposition of Daniel, he says there seems to be a remarkable fitness in commencing the seven times of the kingdom of Babylon with the beginning of of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. So it doesn't start when the tree is cut down, it's when the beginning of his reign. That is, when God declared that he was the head of that image. 603 BC. Good maths? Let's have a look at it. So Daniel 4 and Leviticus 26 both talk about seven times. Seven times of the kingdom of men, Daniel 4. Seven times of punishment for Israel, Leviticus 26. 2,520 days, 603 BC. The Babylonian kingdom of men continues for 2,520 years till the beginning of the time of the end, 1917. Done your maths? It works, I can tell you. <laughs> and at the same time, Leviticus 26, seven times, 2,520 days from the time when Israel is scattered and persecuted and the sanctuary, mentioned in Leviticus 26, becomes overspread with desolations. That's what it says. And after seven times, again, 360 by 7, the time of the end begins in 1917. So here it is in another form. The kingdom of Israel lasted from the time of David, near enough to 1000 BC, to 603 BC, when the head of gold is declared and the beginning of the Babylonian kingdom of men and Jerusalem is made desolate, as it was under Nebuchadnezzar, to 1917, and from 1917 to 2023. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail as we go through. To 2023, that's the time of the end. Brother Thomas says it's a period of the time of the end. So it began in 1917. Now these are the dates we're going to look at during that time. 1917, 2,520 days, ends. 1948, we're going to show from Daniel chapter 12, the 1260 days ends. 1967, the 2,300 days ends. 1978, the 1290 days ends. And 2023. What year are we in now, Dad? You didn't say it loud enough. Say it loud. 2023! The 1335 ends this year. Now you can tell me if I'm wrong later on, but don't, don't tell me yet. Because I want to try and show you how it works to come to this year. So the period of the time of the end, these dates we're going to look at as they are in Daniel's times. 1917, the Ottomans are pushed out, the king of the south pushes at him, and the Balfour Declaration is declared. So there's something about the kingdom of men, there's something about the kingdom of Israel in 1917. 1948, the end of the scattering, 1260 days, we'll see that. The uh, Jerusalem's no longer tr trodden down to the Gentiles, 1967, remarkable times. 1978, what we're going to show is the critical factor there is access to the Temple Mount. And what do I mean by that? Well, we'll see. 2023, Daniel stands in his lot at the end of the 1335 days. And as I said, Every event is connected with Jerusalem and the cleansing of the sanctuary. That's all language taken from right through Daniel. Okay, 1917, the end of the seven times of the Babylonian kingdom of men and the beginning of the time of the end. Daniel 11 verse 40. The king of the south shall push it in. Millions and millions of people died in World War I. Why? 
in God's purpose. Why? So that Jerusalem could begin to be brought out of bondage. That's the reason. All the wars in Europe, everywhere else, all had to do with what happened when General Allenby marched into Jerusalem. That was God's purpose in World War I. And the Balfour Declaration, within days of Jerusalem being back in the, being in the hands of the British people, the Balfour Declaration was issued, where His, Majesty gov- His Majesty's government views with favour the, uh, the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and they will strive their best to do it. So, there are two important points, two important time periods we're looking at that aren't in Daniel chapter 12. Then we're coming to Daniel chapter 12. 1917, 25, 20 days, Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 8, 2,300 days. What does Brother Thomas say about that? Well, Brother Thomas says the end of the 2,300 days of the trampling underfoot of the city of Jerusalem, that's when that occurs. Now, he doesn't give us the date 1967. That was nearly 100 years after he wrote the book. But he gave us all the principles to understand it when we see it. He says the wise will understand this in the time of the end. So the stage is set then for the eventual removal of the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is removed. Now where does the 2300 days start? It starts back in Daniel chapter 8, which you should probably have open because we'll be referring to a few verses from Daniel chapter 8. And that's the vision of the ram and the he-goat. Now the ram, we're told in the prophecy in Daniel chapter 8, the ram on the right hand side there with one horn higher than the other is the Medes and the Persians. The Persian horn is higher and it's a pretty strong ram. But along comes, not touching the ground at such great speed, at such great power, comes the he-goat, the rough he-goat. And you can see the notable horn between his eyes which represents Alexander the Great, doesn't it? Alexander the Great. And he comes charging at the Persians. Comes across the rough goat, we're told, Daniel 8, 21, is the king of Grisha, Alexander the Great. And he comes, uh, what a, a mighty warrior he was. Alexander comes charging at Darius the third, Darius the third, the king of Persia, and it's at the Battle of Isis, 333 BC. Now some people have said, perhaps it's the Battle of Granicus. No, it's not the Battle of Granicus, which is to the west there, um, right at the... Uh, uh, or just, just uh, the very west of uh, Turkey there. Uh, it's not that because uh, Darius III wasn't involved in that battle personally. The prophecy tells us the two kings will meet each other in battle and that happened in the Battle of Isis in 333 BC. So uh, Alexander of course had a great victory there and went on rolling across through Persia, Media and right across to India. After he died his empire was divided amongst his four generals. And you can see there, one uh, on the map, uh, a little horn was poking up. We just saw it, and we'll see it again in a moment. A little horn was one of the four generals right up around near Constantinople. Uh, it merged eventually into the king of the north, the Seleucid kingdom, and the king of the south. But the little horn of the goat, which becomes very powerful, is, uh, grows out of the territory of Lysimachus, one of those generals, and uh, it's uh, in the area of Constantinople, from Pergamum to Constantinople in 312 AD, when Constantine set up the uh, eastern leg of the Roman Empire there. Daniel chapter 8, there was this little horn, it waxed great toward the south the, uh, and the east and the pleasant land. The reason it's become so important is because that power keeps on persecuting the Jewish people, eventually of course, um, and uh, becomes uh, the, uh, em- the Ottoman Empire, uh, which is ultimately driven out by the King of the South. It cast down some of the hosts and the stars of the ground, stamped on them great persecution from that territory down upon the people of the land. So, how long? 333 BC. We're told that the vision will last till 2300 da- days. And it ends in the time of the end. Daniel 8, verse 17. Uh, We read that uh, uh, he came near where I stood. I was afraid. 
I fell on my face and he said, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Verse uh, 19, the last end of the indignation at the time appointed, the end shall be 2,300 days. We're in the time of the end, in other words. So the little horn of the east uh, from 333 BC, moving through history, treads down the host and the sanctuary underfoot because that, uh, uh, that goat tramples everything down under its feet, uh, as goats do, until 1967, and Jerusalem was no longer trodden out of the Gentiles. Done your sums? BC 33, 2300, 1967. How long shall be the vision? Verse 14. Uh, it shall be unto 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What's the sanctuary? The temple site in Jerusalem. We call it the Temple Mount today. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. 1967. Well, it was a huge step towards the cleansing of the sanctuary, wasn't it? The time of the end. Verse 18, I was in a deep sleep. He touched me and set me upright, indicating this is the time also of the resurrection, the time of the end. Uh, the last end, the time appointed, the end shall be. So, how long shall be the vision? 2300 days. There's the soldiers outside the wailing wall, 1967. As the Lord said himself, he said, uh, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. He's talking about Daniel chapter 8 here until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So the times of the Gentiles was 2300 days, 1967. What happened in 1967? A really strange thing. The Jews took the city of Jerusalem, drove out all opposition. The Israeli brigade commander said, we've conquered the Temple Mount, it's in our hands. Two soldiers climb up and put the flag on top of a pole on the Temple Mount. But Moshe Diane, who's in charge at that time, was looking in from Mount Scopus through his binoculars, he's only got one eye. As a matter of fact, the other eye was shot out uh, when he was looking through binoculars in an earlier war. Uh, the other eye was uh, shot out through one of the holes in the binoculars and it was so bad an injury that he couldn't even put a glass eye in, so he wore a patch the rest of his day. He's looking! One eye. He sees the flag up. He says, take it down straight away. Do you want to set the whole Middle East on fire? A lot of people say, well, shouldn't have taken any notice of them. <laughs> Should have kept the Temple Mount, but they didn't. Because the 7th of June, 1967, that day, was not to be the end of the abomination that maketh desolate in God's plan. The abomination that maketh desolate was to stay there. So what is the abomination that maketh desolate? Daniel tells us there's a few places that it appears and we won't turn to these passages as, as such. Daniel 11.31 They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and take away the sacrifices and shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. That happened in BC 167. I'll tell you the details in a moment. Daniel 9 verse 27 they shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That's AD 70. There was another abomination that maketh desolate in AD 70. And then there's this last abomination that maketh desolate that is set up in Daniel 12 for 1,290 days and that happened in 688 AD. What happened? In Daniel 11, that prophecy in Daniel 11 has to do with Antiochus Epiphanes. Now Antiochus Epiphanes was the king of the north at the time. And uh, Antiochus Epiphanes came into Jerusalem and totally overthrew the people. It's the time of the Maccabees. Overthrew the people, uh, went into the temple and, and corrupted that temple. He, he polluted the holy place by putting a statue of Zeus, the great god of the Greeks, in the temple, in the holy place. And he took a pig, which he knew was the most horrible thing you could do in the temple of God, and offered it upon the altar of incense. But it only lasted three years in God's purpose, three years. And three years later, the Jews drove Antiochus Epiphanes' group out of the temple and re-consecrated the temple. And they still celebrate that event today 
in the Feast of Hanukkah. It happens November, December every year. It's a celebration of the reconsecration of the temple after that abomination that made desolate in 167. That was in 164 BC they overcame it. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, in regard to Daniel chapter 9, which is associated with the 70-week prophecy, says, You will see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, then (coughs) run for your lives. When you see that spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso reads, let him understand, us too. When the Roman legions came in and destroyed the temple in AD 70. Now, that abomination didn't remain there, but it certainly was a significant abomination that maketh desolate. The final abomination that maketh desolate being set up was in 688. A long-term structure that desecrates the temple site and makes worship there impossible. So the definition of an abomination that maketh desolate is something which makes worship impossible on the temple mount. And here it is, 167 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes offers the swine to Zeus, AD 70, Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed by the Romans, AD 688, the Dome of the Rock is set up. Where is it built? Right on the temple site, right on Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, the temple site, Solomon's temple site. That's where it is. The desecration that makes worship of the temple impossible. So, for a short period of time, 167 BC, the abomination that maketh this, it was there for three years. From AD 70, spasmodic access for 600 years. And 688, no access, we're told there, for 1,290 years. Wow. So these are the three time periods of Daniel chapter 12. (coughs) Have a look at it. Daniel chapter 12, for the 1260 days, which is recorded there as time, times and a half, which is one year plus two years plus half a year, which equals 1260, we are given the end date. And the end date, we're told there, um, uh, is uh, how long to the end of these wonders uh, verse 7 time, time and a half and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people all these things shall be finished accomplish the power to scatter we're given the end date, that's when it will end in the 1290 days we're given the start date so the start date is verse 11 the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate is set up. 1,290 days. 1,335 days. The blessed is he, verse 12, Daniel 12, who comes to the 1,305 and 30 days, waiting till then. We're not told. Beginning or end. Not apparently, anyway. But we can work it out. We're told just to wait to the 1,335 days. So the first period uh, given us in Daniel 12, 12, 1260 days were given the end date. Time, times and a half when they shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people all these things shall be finished. Accomplished, finished. What do we know in Jeremiah 31? He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. What's that talking about then? This is talking about Israel not being scattered anymore. It will be for a time, times and a half, 360, <coughs> plus 2 times 360, plus 180, half of 360, 1260. When did it become impossible for the Jews to be scattered anymore? 1948. They became a nation. Can you scatter the Jews now? You can't scatter the Jews anymore, can you? The time's accomplished for the Jews to be scattered. So it ends in 1948, this time period. So if it ends then, and it's 1260 days, when did it start? He shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. There's the declaration of the Jewish state in 1948. That's the time that marks the end, and therefore the time period must begin in 688. 688 is the beginning of the 1260 days. All right, 688 was the beginning of the construction 
of the Dome of the Rock, right on the holy site. It's the abomination that makes desolate because the Jews could no longer worship there. Now the 1290 days, we're given the start date. Verse 11, from the time the daily sacrifice was taken away and the abomination set up, 1290 days. Now notice it's not, the word and does not mean until. Some people have suggested, oh this is separate the time of the daily taken away until the abomination is set up. 1290 days and therefore they take it backwards from the time the abomination is set up. But that's not so. Uh, matter of fact, I looked at uh, multiple translations. You can go on biblehub.com and look at about 40 different translations all at once. There was one translation uh, which put it that way until the abomination is set up out of all those 40 and it's called the Contemporary English Version. And I'm sorry when you have a look at it. He, it's all over the place. So don't, Brother Thomas uh, interprets that exactly as it's written. You're taken away and set up, not until it's set up. Uh, and uh, so number one, the daily sacrifice taken away, the abomination that makes desolate set up. Uh, do they have to happen at exactly the same time, concurrently? Uh, fortunately, I found the, the answer in, in uh, Exposition of Daniel, page 120, do they have to happen at the same time? No, the text does not require that they should. And I follow Brother Thomas when he tells me what the text says. Uh, so they don't have to happen exactly at the same time. Sacrifice taken away, abomination set up. But both have to happen before the 1290 days can start. The process of taking away the sacrifices and establishing the abomination actually went from 70 AD when the Romans came in to 688 when the abomination was set up. So the sacrifices were gradually taken away. Yes, the temple was destroyed, but some sacrifices continued to be offered right through to 688 on the Temple Mount. So the abomination set up in 688. Now, just to check this, I went to Wikipedia, which is always, of course, very reliable. <laughs> but fortunately, they had a, a, a number of references supporting this comment. Notice this. When did the sacrifices end? Did they end in AD 70? Exactly. Could they no longer offer sacrifices on the Temple Mount? This is the answer with the references that are used. After the destruction of the Second Temple, sacrifices were prohibited because there was no longer a temple. Offering of sacrifices was briefly reinstated during the Jewish-Roman Wars of the second century and was continued in certain communities thereafter. Putting in another reference that they've referred to, with the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans, the Jewish practice of offering korbanot, or which is the word for various types of sacrifices, for all intents and purposes stopped, but despite subsequent inter intermittent periods of small Jewish groups offering the traditional sacrifices on the Temple Mount, the practice effectively ended. So the people weren't of Israel were not totally scattered in AD 70. Some continued to live there right through until the 7th century, and some of them offered sacrifices. Now, just recently, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who was just appointed Prime Minister when he gave this interview, he making the point in a book that he's written, BB My Story, uh, but uh, uh, he's saying it quite clearly, the Jews were still in possession of the land, utilising the land, and as we saw from Wikipedia, offering some sacrifices, even on the Temple Mount, right up until the 7th century. When's the 7th century? The 600s, isn't it? The 600s of the 7th century. 688, when the abomination of the Make of Desolate was built, is in the 7th century. Now just have a listen to what Netanyahu says. So the Bible describes how the Jewish people lived on this land, were attached to this land, fought off conquerors, sometimes were conquered, but stayed on their land. And that uh, continued uh, for a very long time until roughly the 6th, 7th century actually, uh, after the birth of Christ, okay? Uh, we were conquered by the Romans, we were conquered by the Byzantines, they did a lot of bad things to us, but they didn't really exile us, contrary to what people think, okay? The ones, uh, the, the loss of our land actually occurred when the Arab conquest took place in the 7th century. The Arabs burst out from Arabia, 
And they did something that no other conqueror, not the Romans, not the Byzantines, not the Greeks before them, not Alexander the Great, nobody did before. They actually started taking over the land of the Jewish farmer. Though it is under the Arab conquerors that the Jews lost their homeland. You said the Arabs came in in the seventh century, and that's a long time ago. And so from the seventh century to now, the Jews were dispossessed. We were flung to the far corners of the earth, uh, suffered unimaginable suffering because we had no homeland, but we didn't disappear. And we never gave up the dream of coming back to our ancestral homeland. And they said, next year in Jerusalem, we'll come back next year in Jerusalem. So we're given the event that marks the beginning of the 1290 days. 1290 days so it starts with the construction of the Dome of the Rock in 688 AD in the 7th century. And that's when the Jews were finally scattered and couldn't worship there anymore. Plus 1290 days, 1978. What happened in 1978? Well, a moment ago, we said the Camp David Accords. But what was it about the Camp David Accords? Yes, President Sadat and Prime Minister Bagan got the Nobel Peace Prize. The world recognised what was going on. Why didn't we notice that date? Now, yes, it was the first time that the peace agreement uh, was worked out, hammered out, between uh, Israel and a neighbour, Egypt. But more than that, look at the fine print of the Camp David Accords. And I had to dig for this. And I dug and I found what I was looking for. Something about Jerusalem. There had to be something about Jerusalem in 1978. And this is what it was. There was nothing about Jerusalem in the formal agreements of the Camp David Accords, but attached annex and letters, the fine print. There was a letter written by President Sadat to Prime Minister Begin via President Jimmy Carter that set out seven points yep, <laughs> relative to Jerusalem. Seven points about Jerusalem, but point number five is the important one. He's, this is President Sadat, a Muslim. You know, guardians of the Dome of the Rock. The, the chief neighbour of Israel that signed this agreement said, all peoples must have free access to the city. This is about Jerusalem and enjoy the free exercises of worship and the right to visit and transit to the holy places without distinction or discrimination. That's what he said. That's what he agreed to. And you know it hasn't happened on the ground much yet. But that's the beginning. That's the beginning of access to the Temple Mount. That's the beginning of the end of the abomination of desolation. It's yet to come. But have a look at this. Over the years, since 1978, very few Jews have been able to visit, but much more recently, many more have. What is extraordinary is that we are praying on the Temple Mount, facing the place of the Holy Temple. It's extraordinary because, as I said a couple of years ago, we would have all been arrested for doing this. It's extraordinary because for 2,000 years, Jews couldn't do this. It's extraordinary because we've made it this far, we're this close, the... Uh, the, after the silent prayer, the prayer leader uh, repeats the prayer uh, out loud and we all answer Amen at the appropriate places. That's what we're doing right now. As you see, uh, people praying and people uh, reciting uh, verses from, from Tanakh, from the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, again, any of this until a couple of years ago, you'd be stopped by the police taken off the mount, taken in for questioning, maybe for a few hours, and distance from the mount, maybe for months. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. We have a lot more progress to make. And we're making this progress because people are going up, Jews are going up to the Temple Mount, and in larger and larger numbers, and insisting, and not being silent. It's incredible what's going on, isn't it? So 1978 marks the beginning of the end for the abomination of desolation, because Sadat agreed. I know he got assassinated shortly after this. Uh, obviously, not all the Arabs agreed with what he'd done. All peoples must have free access to the city and to the holy places. So that's going to happen, and it's happening more and more. And at the beginning of this year, uh, this uh, 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 Ben Gavir, who's uh, now the Minister for Security in Israel, uh, took it upon himself to lead the charge to go up to the Temple Mount. הר הבית זה המקום הכי חשוב לעם ישראל. הר הבית פתוח לכולם. עולים כאן מוסלמים, נוצרים, 
וכן, גם יהודים, גם יהודים, בממשלה שאני חבר בה לא תהיה אפליה גזענית, ויהודים יעלו להר הבית, אנחנו מבהירים לחמאס. אנחנו לא נכנעים, לא מתקפלים, לא ממצמצ... אינה אקטחם אל וזיר אל ישראלי בן גפיר, ללמסג'ד אל אקסל מובארק סבח אל יום, יושקל תחדי חטיר, למשאר ג'מיע אבנה אל שעב אל פלסטין. Of course, the Palestinians made a big thing of that that happened in January and said it was the storming of the Temple Mount. We know he only just walked up there and was there for 13 minutes, so I understand. But it was a Jewish Jews are storming the Temple Mount. This is creating great uh, potential division. We know that Ramadan's about to start, Passover's about to start, Easter's about to start, and they've already had conferences down in uh, Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, between the Americans, the uh, Palestinians, Arabs and Israel to try and stop uh, what is potentially a flame of fire uh, coming out uh, from uh, the area of the Temple Mount and the Al-Aqsa Mosque over the coming days. Very, very exciting times we live in. What about the 1335 days? We're not given a start date or an end date directly. Are the angels We're not giving us a start or end date trying to fool us? Uh, is it a guessing game? What's the 1335 mean? It's not. The words are closed up until the time of the end, but the wise will understand about the 1335 days. And Brother Thomas gives us the clue in his book. But here it is. Brother Thomas says, 1,290 days, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to 1,305 and 30 days, 1335 days, but he, he says in page 120, the 1335 years have an epochal beginning in common with the 1290. In other words, the 1290 and the 1335 start at the same time. And as a matter of fact, the 1260 starts at the same time too. So, what are we being told? The wise will understand that after the 1290 days conclude, 1978, they must wait for just another 45 years. 1335 1290 to 1335, just wait another 45 years, for then they will arrive at the end of the time of the end, the end of the days. So that's the same start date. We, we were given the information about the end date of the scattering, 1948, we went back to 688 from that. The start date for the 1290 is the same, 688, and 1335 start date is the same too ending in 2023. So Brother Thomas said, the time of the end has its beginning and ending and period intermediate between the beginning and the ending. That's that period of time. 1917, you can see it all there. Turks are driven out. The scattering of the holy people has ended. Jerusalem's no longer trodden underfoot by the Gentiles. The end begins for the abomination of desolation because other people are able to know, go, now go up to the Temple Mount the Dome of the Rock is going to come to its end. The time of the end, Daniel stands in his lot, and so do we at the end of the days. Is the end of the days right at the 1335? We can't be absolutely sure. But here's this period of the time of the end. So the key dates, time of the end starts in 1917. The last date we are given by Daniel is 2023. We're told about 1948, 1967, 1978, all end times, time periods that we're given. At the time of the end shall be the vision. Why is the time of the end taking so long? Key question. Why is it taking so long? Well, one answer, a very simple answer is, and this is part of the answer, God doesn't ever do anything abruptly. Remember in the time of the flood, God gave creation 120 years. Uh, even with Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, there was uh, the, the first warning was when the kings of the north came down and sacked the city and took Lot and families and everybody else away, and they were rescued. And and Abraham said, "I won't have anything to do with that city. You know, don't ever give me a shoelace from that city." But Lot and his crowd went back. But that was a warning. They were given ample warning. It wasn't just, wasn't just the angels arriving that night. They were given ample warning. Well, have a look back. 
The decree of Cyrus, which was to rebuild Jerusalem, was given in the year 536 BC. Go back and rebuild Jerusalem. Consider what happened all that time. All the challenges they had, all the neighbours, you know, persecuting them, all under Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah. And then Nehemiah went back, of course, Nehemiah came down in, um, in 456 uh, and he said to uh, uh, Alexerxes, I'll be away 12 years. So after 12 years, he went back in 444 BC. 14 years later, it just says in Nehemiah, after certain days I came back. Malachi prophesied about that. In 14 years, <laughs> that nation had fell into such enormous decay, moral decay and ruin, marrying outside, kids that couldn't even speak the language, you know, and Nehemiah grabbing by a beard. And, you know, Malachi said, you look out when the Lord comes. He's coming to his own. Who may abide the day of his coming? So he comes as a judge. He cleanses the temple. He purifies the sons of Levi. All that took 106 years from the time of the decree to go back to the time of judgment by the one who types the Lord Jesus Christ. So what happens in our day? Why is it taking so long? Isn't the Balfour Declaration, doesn't that remind you of the decree of Cyrus? Go back to your land. It's the same thing. Cyrus said, go back and rebuild Jerusalem. A foreign country said, go back. The Balfour Declaration, the British said, go back to your land. 106 years later, it's 2023. It's incredible to think, isn't it? Incredible to think. What an amazing thing. Now, and it's, it just blows my mind to think we're in the same time period of the return of the Jews to their land. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. What's got to happen next? The Lord returns. There's nothing else. All the time periods are finished. This year. What happens next? The Lord returns. The resurrection. The quick and the dead are gathered to the judgment. Will it be this year? We don't know. We don't know. But according to everything that hangs together, this is the last time period we are going to be given. This is it. It's the time of the end. The 1335 years is the end of the time of the end, that period, the end of the time of the end, and the wise shall understand.